Hey, let's go ahead and dismiss our kids and our youth to their classes. We love you guys. And as they're being dismissed, if you would grab, if you would uh, go ahead and grab your Bibles. We're in Philippians chapter 1. I'm sorry, Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2, stand at the reading of God's holy word, would you please? All right. Now, in order for us to have the dimension we need to and get the context, we need to go back and we need to pick it up at verse 27 in the, um, in the first chapter. Remember, Paul was making a decision whether or not to just prepare himself for heaven because he knows his time is short here on earth or to contend in the, contend to to stay alive um, and, and to be able to stick around, contend in faith that he's going to love this church, he's going to keep ministering, somehow or another miss, miss his execution day with, with Caesar. He's not quite sure. I mean, he, he believes love dictates that he's going to stay for the church to serve them. He thinks this is the right thing to do for sure, but he's really not positive. He's not sure that's what God has in store. And so he then writes to this church who's being persecuted the same way as Paul is being persecuted. And let's pick it up at verse 27. Whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel. Then whether I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in one spirit, contending as one man for the faith of the gospel without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you. This is a sign to them that they will be destroyed, but that you will be saved, and that by God. For it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ, not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for him. For since you are going through the same struggle you saw I had, and now hear that I still have. If you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any fellowship with the, Holy, with the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and purpose. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. Father God, thank you so much for your holy word. Father, it is eternal, it is absolute, it is sufficient. Father, your word is truth. And we just surrender our heart to you and to it. Speak by it and use it now to shape us and to guide us. We give ourselves to you, King Jesus, to this word, for it is our marching orders. We give ourselves to you, Holy Spirit, for you're transforming us more and more and more to obey and to live according to the truths and principles of this word. Father, all for your glory, we now come with the attitude to hear, to commune with Jesus, and to obey in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Amen? Amen. Turn around and say to one another, I'm Cheerios, you're Fruit Loops. Go ahead, would you please? <laughs> now, while still on earth, you may be seated, while still on earth, just a few hours before his... Um, crucifixion, Jesus prayed to Father God about those who would come to believe in him through the apostles' ministry. And amazingly, that prayer has reached 2,000 years now, and that prayer applies to you and I in Emmett, Idaho. Can you believe that? Jesus, 2,000 years ago, while he was still on earth, was praying for us right here in our little church. 
Mind-boggling. Mind-boggling, but he was. Even more mind-boggling was what Jesus was praying. Let's look at part of that prayer. Look, look, look at what he prayed. Read it with me. This is Jesus' prayer to Father God. May they be brought to complete unity to let the world know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. You see that? Now, first of all, there, there is something just in that prayer alone that shows us how vital unity is. Without unity, the world has no demonstration that Jesus came. Is that what he said? May they be brought to complete unity so the world can know what? That you sent me. We demonstrate to the world right now an event that happened 2,000 years ago. Why? Because we are to live Jesus' life. We're to, Jesus is to live through us. Amen? Amen. Now, now as, as mind-blowing as that is, look at this. Look at the next thing that he says. Not only that the world will know that you sent me, but how much does Father God loves us? How much? And have loved what? Even... Do you catch that? You mean Father God loves you to the same degree as he loves Jesus Christ? What? See, Father God's love is infinite and knows no bounds. And Father God's love is for you. Wowzers. In the same degree his love is for his son. But there's such a vast difference between me and his son. Father God loves us just the same. But now here's the clincher of Jesus' prayer. Did you notice that he didn't say, Father God, help them at least kind of agree with each other. What did he pray up here? What's he praying? Father God, help them come to what kind of unity? Complete. What? Complete. Complete unity. So here's my question. When Jesus prayed that prayer, did Father God say yes to his request or did Father God say no to his request? Yes. Now, the way you and I treat each other sometimes, it would seem like Father God said no. But really, the truth is, Father God said, absolutely. Well, if that's the case, you see, first of all, let, 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 let me just, here's a side note for you. Here's, here's the extra little sermon for you. First of all, Jesus never said anything that he didn't hear his father say. Didn't he say that? And Jesus never did anything that he ne never saw his father do. When Jesus even prayed this prayer, all he was doing was articulating what he was hearing from the father's heart. Right? So we know it's the father's will. And we know the Bible says anything we ask according to the Father's will, he hears us. And if we know he hears us, we know we have what we asked of him. Look it up, 1 John chapter 5. Amen. Right? So we know that this is the very heart of Father God. And we know it's his will. It's just that we don't understand sometimes how the Father has actually answered that for us. You see, un unlike the eHarmony commercials, the Holy Spirit doesn't scientifically match Christians in, in churches according to certain number of points of human compatibility to ensure we're all unified. Now, I want you to look around at each other. I want you to look at the variety. It's amazing. How in the world did we get put together with each other? Isn't this, is this remarkable? That alone is almost a miracle in and of itself. But it's the Lord. It's the Lord. You see, here's the truth. When Jesus prayed that prayer, God said yes. And what God did was given us all the resources we need in our relationship with Jesus Christ to be completely unified. He said yes. It's a package deal in 
the Son. And Paul understood that. And so this is why, even though this precious church in Philippi is going through persecution like Paul was going through it, he reminded them uh, there in verse 27 in the first chapter to, to live worthy of Christ, where in one spirit and as one man they stand firm and contend for the faith of the gospel. See, he understood that there are blessings and truths and principles that are ours in our relationship with Jesus where even if persecution breaks out, even if we go through the toughest of the toughest of times, brothers and sisters, even if some of us stumble and fail and some of us, you know, just, just mess up big time, listen, even if the worst that of those kinds of things can happen, you and I, in Christ Jesus, have everything we need to have and to stay in complete loving unity with each other. And so this is, this is where Paul then begins to focus their attention. Look at that first verse there in the second chapter of Philippians. Read it with me, would you? If you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then he'll say, then make my joy compete by being like-minded and so on. Now, now, Christians, every one of us in our ongoing relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ have all the blessings we need to maintain a loving heart of unity with one another. Pastor, they bug me to death. Yes, I understand that. You have everything you need in Jesus to have loving unity with them. Pastor, they've made some stupid choices. Yes. You have everything you need to have loving unity with them. Amen. Pastor, they, they like rap music. Yes. Okay, forget it. No, no, no. Yes. Yes, I embrace it. Don't understand it. I embrace it. We have everything we need in Christ Jesus. To have. Look, 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 look at the four things he says. First of all, by, by the way, you notice what four words does he use in that verse? Four times. What, what words? Say it loud. If you have any, any, any. You know why he uses the word any? Because even if you have a teensy weensy little bit of encouragement from being united with Christ, that's enough to tap into to have unity. Even if you have a teensy weensy little bit of comfort from his love, that's enough to tap into to, to have unity. Even if there's a teensy weensy little bit of fellowship with the Holy Spirit because you're so busy, that's enough. That's enough. Even if there's a teensy weensy little bit of tenderness and compassion. Now the good news is, is in Jesus we have all these things. The Word of God just tells us. It tells us that we have eternal encouragement in Christ Jesus. In, in, in 2 Thessalonians 2, 16 and 17, we've got this encouragement in Christ. He is a continual sent source of encouragement. Is he not? Amen. I, amen. Aren't you encouraged by your Savior, the fact that he's Savior? And the Lord? Yeah. And how about comfort from his love? It says in 2 Corinthians 1, 5, it says, Just as the sufferings of Christ spell over into our life, so his comfort spells over. Every day, there's a source in your relationship with Jesus of comfort. Well, Pastor, I haven't felt it. Well, let me ask you something. How are you doing in your relationship with Jesus? How, how are you doing pressing in and, and actually not, not just saying I officially believe in the Lord and not just saying, oh, I'm going to read my um, daily bread this morning. Quick, get my five chapters done. Whew, I've done everything God told me to do. No, 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 no. Consciously, with our heart, pressing in to the one who's King of kings and Lord of lords. Pressing in to the real Lord and Savior. Loving him and talking to him and worshiping him. And doing it consciously. 
See, this is relationship that God has called us to have with him. Let me tell you, it's in that that we'll find comfort. It's in that we'll find his encouragement. It's in that we'll find that koinonia with the Holy Spirit. The Bible says that it affirms the very last chapter of 2 second, of second Corinthians, um, chapter 13, verse 14. It affirms we have fellowship ongoing koinonia with the person of the Holy Spirit. When was the last time you said, hello, Holy Spirit, I love Love you help me follow you today in your lead and actually paid attention to him <coughs> amen and then it says in Colossians 3 12 clothe yourself with the Lord Jesus Christ listen you and I and have that compassion of the Lord that tenderness of the Lord see this isn't just things to motivate us to unity this is stuff that we have that we can minister once I've tapped into this with Jesus, it's kind of like, are, are you guys like me? I don't need a lot of coffee, but I need coffee in the morning. Amen. You know, I, how many of you are coffee drinkers? My brothers and sisters in the Lord. <laughs> I, I only need two cups. I used to have a whole pot. Now I'm down to two cups. That's what I need. But, you know, it's kind of like, if we could have a dependency on that relationship with Jesus where we're receiving these things from him like we depend on our coffee and then give it away. How can you not be encouraged by the Lord and start encouraging? You, you know what I love about my Facebook friends that's in this church? They encourage me every day. And they comfort me. And, and they're thankful. They, they find all these great verses and all these great pictures and they, and they share it for one another and they share it. And I invite you to be a part of a Facebook thing and I know that you think the computers are antichrist. They're not, you know. But, but, and, you know, but I'm telling you. In fact, you know, there's a lot of these, a lot of people in our church, they're doing every day, they're giving thanks for something. I decided not to do it. You know what I'm doing? I'm going through what each one of you are giving thanks and I'm giving thanks for the the Father for the same thing. You are blessing my socks off. You are ministering to me. Amen. Oh, it's just, just really wonderful. This is the stuff. This is the blessings. This is, this is a source that we could tap into to completely be unified. Okay, so, but it just doesn't stop there. This is just the blessings. So since we have this, look, look at verse 2. Then he goes on and he says, read it with me. Then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and in purpose. Now, now let me, let me um, share with you something that I think you already know. Unity is not to be mistaken with uniformity. You know what I mean? Unity is not the same thing as uniformity. Un uniformity is where we dress totally alike, do everything alike, talk alike, Eat, eat the same kinds of food, listen to the same kind of music, listen to all that stuff. Quite frankly, quite frankly, th that kind of cookie cutter Christianity smacks of cultishness. That's not really what the Holy Spirit brings about. It really isn't. You know, um, God, God loves variety. Now, some, some people out there will tell you, you know, God has different churches and, and one church is uh, Cheerios. And another church is, oh boy, they have all the, they have, you know, all the jocks go to that church. So that's the, that's, you know, the Wheaties church over there. And, and, the, oh, there's the older people church. That's fiber one down there. <laughs> and every community has one of those kinds of churches. So that's Fruit Loops over there. And then there's the church that has the rock group. They're Rice Krispies, because Snap, Crackle, Pop, you know. And, 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 and people really believe that what God does is he gets people saved and then he says, oh no, you're Rice Krispies, go to the Rice Krispies. Oh, you're total fiber, you better go over there. No, 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 no. That was never in God's heart and plan. Ever, ever, ever. Before, before I had diabetes, one of my very favorite kinds of, uh, of cereals was all of them. I thought it was genius when they came up with, you know what I'm talking about? Variety pack. So smart. 
because I've got Cocoa Krispies, I've got Captain Crunch, you know, I, I have, I'm Sugar Bear, you know, I've got a little bit of that there. I've got all that variety pack, and you can have and pick and choose and have, but it's all together. It's all sealed up together, and it has the same purpose, to just make me happy and nourish me. <laughs> and quite frankly, that really is what God has in mind. So how is it then, can, I'm, I want you just to look around at this group right now. Just go ahead, look at each other. Don't, it's not awkward unless you make a face. Go ahead, make a face. <laughs> make a face at someone, now it's awkward. All right, all right, so, so, so look at this group, okay? Fruit Loops, man. I, I'm not pointing at anybody. There's some marshmallows in here. <laughs> You know, oh, I'm after me lucky charms. You know, I just, you know, there, there, there's all kinds of us in here. So what is it that makes all of us unified? How can this eclectic group be so unified? He tells us in, in, in verse 2. Here's the basis of our unity. Make it my, make, um, then make my joy complete by first of all being like-minded. C.S. Lewis said, if two people agree on everything, one person isn't thinking. So how is it that Christians, you and I, can be like-minded? Well, I'll tell you how. Our like-mindedness is based on the Holy Bible. And it's based on how we embrace the Holy Bible. Our like-mindedness is based on the Holy Bible is absolute, God's absolute standard of truth it is eternal, it is anointed, it is flawless, it is sufficient. God's word is God's word. And by the way, this is, this is something we hold to in this church. Amen? Amen? And because we hold to that in this church, not only do we say that about the Bible, but we understand that God's holy word then is to give us a biblical worldview. It's, it's to give us um, a biblical worldview, not only to view the world from, but to think from. When we think scripturally, we are being like-minded. Even though there's part of me that might not like this or part of me that wants to go light on that, if the scriptures say this is sin, we say it is sin. Regardless of my personal opinion of it, we are like-minded because the Word of God says it's sin, then it's sin. Amen? Oh, look at where we're But I know what you're thinking. Wait a minute. There's stuff in the Bible that how can we be like-minded? Pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib. So, so how can we be like-minded about that? There's no doubt there's things in God's word that, that are not, that he doesn't give it to us like we have to, they are, they are essential doctrines, right? That there's liberty in how we're going to embrace them. Amen? Amen. And there is great liberty. So in other words, if you embrace post-trib, we're not going to say you get out of here, you heretic. No, there's nothing like that. No. No, 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 because you're basing what you believe from a set scriptures that you think are right. But let me, let me tell you what we all believe, where we're like-minded. We might not be like-minded in exactly the timing, but aren't we all like-minded? King Jesus Amen. rose again, literally, physically, the third day. And he ascended into heaven. And King Jesus is coming back to take his church to be with us forever. Amen? Oh, we're like-minded. See? We can do that. We can be that. So there's the, on, when it comes to biblical essentials, oh yeah, we're like-minded. Well, look at the next thing. Having the same love. Well, wait a minute. I love jazz. Some of you love rap. Some of you love country. By the way, I love also good Texas swing when it's done right. I really like that a lot. By the way, I love big bands. Oh, yeah. And I also love 50s music. I love all that stuff, right? Well, how is it that we can have the same love? It's not talking about our particular tastes. 
outside Jesus, here's the same love. Romans 5, 5, the Holy Spirit shed abroad the love of God in our hearts. Every one of us has the same love from the Holy Spirit for Father God. Every one of us has the same love by the Holy Spirit for one another. And every one of us has the same love given by the Holy Spirit for a lost world. Amen. We have the same love. If you're a Christian, you have the same love that I have. He shed it abroad in our hearts. And that's what we use. And that's what we tap into. And that's what we base. We have, we're like-minded from the Word of God. We have the same love from what the Holy Spirit has downloaded in us. Amen. And look what else. Being one in what? Spirit and purpose. Well, how can we be one in purpose? You know? Some of you like wood to, to heat. Some of you like gas, some of you like electric. How can we be one purpose? Because it has nothing to do with what you heat your home with. Here's the one purpose. Every one of us, if you're a Christian, you have a passion to promote Jesus in all you do and in all you are. Amen? And listen, when you have that passion to promote Jesus in all you are and all you do, so do we. Guess what? We're one in spirit and we're one in purpose. We want Jesus to come through, don't we? Well, don't we want Jesus to be glorified here? Don't we want Jesus to come through in this church? Don't we want people to experience the real living Jesus, the truth of Jesus, the heart of Jesus, the touch of Jesus? Amen? We're one in spirit, and we're one in purpose. Oh, well, maybe that. But it's when churches get off, and it's when Christians get off of letting the Word of God be their absolute and take their worldview. It's when the Christians walk away from the love the Holy Spirit has shed abroad in their hearts. It's when we Christians forget about our passion for Jesus. That's when things get messed up. Let me show you what I mean. Look what he says. First part of verse 3. Read it with me. Do nothing out of Selfish. ambition or vain conceit. Do nothing out of, in other words, stop living for self-promotion and gain. Do nothing out of selfish ambition. How many of you know that a church is a good place to find a mate? How many of you know the church is a wrong place for you to go to if that's all you're doing is trying to find a mate? See, church is not about dating. Church is about coming and exalting Jesus Amen. and doing, doing, our, doing you know, our marching orders from the Lord. That's what church is about. Amen? A amen. I, I'm just telling you. And, and what happens, I was a part of a really, really big church. And, and that's the church I grew up in. We had over a thousand people in our church. And, and um, this congregation, it was a, it was a neat church. It's, that's where I was mentored at. And um, in this church, because it was so big, we would always get people who felt like God has called them to be a part of our church. But what they were is they were Shackley salesmen. They were Amway salesmen. Y'all remember those things? They were Fuller Brush salesmen. We even had gals, I, I don't know if this is probably too old for some of you, but we even had gals come to our church and they were, I think they called them sculptress bras. <laughs> and the reason why they came to church is because it was so big and once they started coming, they'd have all these contacts and they could just make their business fly. That's disunity, man. That's not about Jesus at all. It really isn't. And so we had this, we, we, we had this little rule that we decided to have because, you know, everyone, you know, it's not like going to church before church and after church getting hit up by all these people. I mean, you know, that makes you feel like worshiping. You know, here, here you are sitting down ready to, ready to just call, call out and repent to the Lord and someone slips you a piece of paper and you look down and, you know, Shackley, got a great deal, call me. Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? So this is the deal. We said no cell zone. 
we, you know, we understood people had their own little cottage industries. That's fine. Do that out there. No cell zone. Any, any activity we did in church, no cell. At all. Couldn't do it. Couldn't talk it. It was amazing how many people felt the Spirit told them to go to another church. <laughs> and God answered our prayer. Yeah. Do nothing out of selfish ambition. Right? Or, what else? Vain conceit. In other words, stop living for personal glory and people's praises and people's opinions. That, that gets really hard because some, we're, we're gifted people. Some of us, you know, our, talent, our talents are surrendered to the Lord. We want them to use those things for his glory. But, but really what happens is when it becomes all about me, again, church becomes all about me. Now, now I love and I praise God for his gifts of evangelists. But there, quite frankly, are certain evangelists on TV that when you watch them, they're arrogant. And, and, and they are so arrogant, they come across and they will tell you that this is the spirit you're feeling. And, and I want to tell you something. You're, you're feeling a world spirit. You're not feeling the Holy Spirit. Because if there was anything that Jesus was when he ministered on this earth, it was not arrogant. He was humble. Take my yoke upon you. For I'm humble, he said, and I'm meek. And that really is where we need to come across. And that's the kind of Jesus we need to show this world. Amen? Amen. But when they're coming across and they're just all this arrogant and they're all this pushy and they're, and they're brash and they say these kinds of weird things and, and you get out and you know, they just command and, rah, rah, and they think, oh, this is the anointing. There's no anointing there at all. That doesn't smack of Jesus. This is not the Holy Spirit. Listen, we got to understand who the Word of God shows us Jesus is. Would you say amen? Amen. 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 Nothing out of vain conceit. It's not about me. It's not about you. As a matter of fact, we become unified when we start coming to church and start getting set free from us. That it's not about me, it's not about you, it's about surrendering ourselves so it could all be about Jesus. And when we have that attitude, we walk away, we go, why do I feel delivered? Because we're finally set free from us. Amen. But finally, finally, he says, the last two little attitudes, as he begins to talk about attitudes, the last part of three in verse four. But in humility, consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. But in humility, consider others better than yourselves. Now, I want you just to think about this for a sec. But in humility, consider others better than yourself. And he's not asking you to have false humility. He's asking you to actually have a true sense of yourself and a true sense of servanthood. How in the world can I think everybody is better than me? When I finally come to grips with the sinful me that got saved. Paul said, here is a trustworthy saying, Christ came to save sinners of whom I am the worst. And church should be this, no, I am the worst. No, I am the worst. But quite frankly, some of us, we have only seen just a teeny skim of what our wretchedness was like. And we said, oh, Jesus, please come into my heart. You know, thank you very much. I don't, under, I don't identify with this person doing this. I don't identify with this person doing that. And I'm telling you, if you can't identify with that person doing this, that person doing that, then you have not had a true biblical revelation of the wretchedness of who we all were before we were saved. Because every one of us was dead in our sins and transgressions, the Bible says. Every one of us shook our fist at God and considered him our enemy. Every one of us considered his word foolish. Every one of us. See, you perhaps, but I got saved so early. Well, let the Holy Spirit show you that your fallen heart before Jesus came in, it, was all, it had already broken all ten of them, just waiting to happen in your life. All ten commands. 
That's why Jesus said, if you look upon a woman with lust in your heart, you've already committed adultery. That's why the Word of God says that if you hate your brother, you've already committed murder. And see, once we start allowing the Lord to show us the true condition of our wretchedness, then we can say, oh, oh, how he loves me. Oh, how he saved me. Oh, how he cleansed me. That's why Jesus said, to him who is forgiven much, there goes a little pumpkin, to him who is forgiven much, loves much, to him who is forgiven little, loves little. Now, it doesn't mean that anybody has forgiven little. Let me tell you, there's not a Christian that is a real Christian that's been forgiven little. Every Christian that's a real Christian has been forgiven much. Amen. Oh, come on. Every Christian that's a real Christian has been forgiven much. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. And it's when we start doing that, we say, oh, Lord. Oh, Lord. My king and my master was a servant. I can certainly be a servant. And my king and my master did not come to be served, but he came to serve, and he came to seek and save. That's what his word says. See, so when I have this humility that considers others better, then, then I start having this thought, each person from child up deserves my best. And I'm here to give it to them. And Jesus, if I... Can I tell you an embarrassing story? I've got a million of them about me. So. Was it when you the yeah, I just did that now. <laughs> By the way, oh, last week, I had a pin fall from the pulpit last week. And in our first service, I had the front row is all OCD people. Because not only they watched the pin, and, and I was preaching, and they watched the pin drop. And, and it's not like the pin was going any place, but these, this whole front row, they looked at the pin, then they looked at me, looked at the pin, looked at me, looked at me. It's like they were tortured. And then, and then I think it was Chad came up first and he said something to me. Oh, he just kind of picked up the pin and nobody you know, saw that he did it. All five of those people came and they started looking for, where's the pin? They couldn't, you know? It's like, these poor people, we need to pray some deliverance on them, man. All right, embarrassing story, embarrassing story. So I was 16 years old and I drove this car, uh, 61 Bel Air Chevy, and I, we, we call it the green latrine. <laughs> and, uh, and, and I was, I was, uh, pulling up to church. I was a little bit late and I was pulling up at a big church, big parking lot. People were coming in parking and, and, and like I pulled up and I pulled in, as I pulled up in the church, the, my bumper was probably a little bit over the line, not much, but that was no big deal. Hey, we, we are not under the law, we're under liberty and I just pulled up like that. So anyway, I come walking into church all hippified like my old hippified self in the 60s. A anyway, so I, I, I come walking into the church and one of the elders of the church greeted me at the door and he said, uh, Tim, it's good to have you in church. Said, it's good to have you, baby. You know, that's good. And he said, uh, I noticed that you par parked your car a little skewed. He said, you know, that would cause some people to not want to park there and it would just be a little difficult for some of the older people. And I looked at him and I go, ah, pff, what are you talking about? Ah, man, not, you know. He goes, well, you know, I would really like it if, could you please kind of go back? I'm not going out there. I'm not, you're nuts, man. I'll just give me a, you guys, man, you guys. Well, as I was doing all of this, old arrogant me at 16, um, my pastor, who, by the way, is an executive pastor, this is a big church, and this is, you know, but he, his heart was just so humble. My pastor was walking by and he was overhearing this. And he came up to me, he goes, he goes, oh, Tim, Tim, no, no, it's okay. I know you want to get a seat with, with, with your friends in church. Would you give me your keys? And so I thought, he's going to make that elder move my car. I thought, this car, this is great, man. <laughs> sure, here. And as I was making my way in, I was going, where's Pastor? Where's Pastor? He was out there gladly parking my car the right way for me. This guy, man, 
he didn't think he was awful. And he was on TV. He didn't think he was awful. He didn't think he was all more than that because he had a church of about 2,000 people. He just wanted to serve. I want to be like that when I grow up. <laughs> Not only look out for your own interests, but look out for the interests of others. See, have this attitude where, where we start thinking about what we're really family. We don't just come to church and say hi to each other and then just block everybody out of our minds as if we don't exist until the next week. We start loving each other and caring for each other and start thinking about each other. We start hearing, overhearing, oh, this person needs, I heard this person needed some wood, and then, oh, I just found out that someone wants to give away some wood. I'm looking out for their interest. Can I, please, can I? And what, what do they need? And what do they, when I, I, there's a, and I could embarrass her because she'd get really embarrassed. A sister in our church heard one time that I loved a certain kind of Campbell's soup. Uh, and it was just a particular hard kind of soup, and Albertsons wasn't carrying it. She heard that. And this, listen, this sister was not making money. She's, she's, you know, she's one of our precious sisters that's trusting Jesus, but she lives paycheck to paycheck, barely. And she came to church, and she said, oh, here, by the way, I got something for you. And I open it up, it was three cans of this. She thought about me during the week, and she was in Boise, and she, th she ran across that soup. And, and I was so humble. So humble. That's, that's, that's how we're supposed to be, you guys. Now, when I look over us and when I look over our congregation, I don't see arrogant people here. You wouldn't fit in well. But you know what I do see? I see busy people. And I, and I see us get so in bondage to, the, to our busyness that as much as we want to be these kinds of people, what the Lord says. It's just we don't have think time and we're not taking time and plugging into Jesus and thinking about one another and oh we would love to do it maybe when I retire. I want to tell you something. Most retired people I know they're so busy they wish they were working again. They were able to sleep regular and they're I'm serious. It's just a value that we're going to have to sit there and say, you know what, Jesus, make me this way. Because it's ours in you. We can be brought to complete unity because it's already ours in Jesus. The stuff that does it is ours in Jesus. Amen? Let's, let's, let's pray. And then we're going to sing that song again that we sang last week. And I'm going to have you just give you a long assignment. We prayed together, so but there's an assignment I'm going to give you. But Father God, this is, this is your heart for us, and this is what you want. And it doesn't matter what season of life we're in. It doesn't matter what we're going through. It doesn't matter what I'm going through personally, Lord, in my life. I have the resources I need in you, Jesus, to be in complete unity with my brothers and sisters. And it doesn't matter if they are so different than I am. It doesn't matter if this guy likes King James and this guy likes, likes the, the English Standard Version. It doesn't matter, Lord. What matters is, is our take on your word and it's holy and true. See, these things are what matter. But Lord, I pray that you will just set us free from ourselves and set us free from the perceived notion that we're too busy because I think that's a lie of the enemy. I think that if we want something enough that, Lord, we can make it happen. And Jesus, you're there to ensure that it will. Holy Spirit, you will lead us. Help us to be people of your word and to obey this, Lord, I pray in Jesus' name.